So once again, thank you everyone for joining us. I know some of you were here for our first week. So welcome back to our second week. We still have some people coming in. We've expanded our program so we can now allow up to 500 people to come in and enjoy this wonderful panel. As soon as it hits eight, I will formally start over a couple of rules and then we'll let the panelists take over. All right, actually 8 p.m. So welcome everyone to Coaches on Couches episode two. Uh, today we have a wonderful panel and we're going to be discussing strategies and techniques for training returning gymnasts. So basically how to prepare our athletes for returning back to the gym. As most of you know, phase one is happening this weekend for many states and many gymnasiums are listed under phase one. So that means you're allowed to open your facility. How are you going to handle that? What kind of curriculum are you going to do? How are you going to change the program? How are you going to handle your students, your staffing? We're going to try to address all those questions for today. So I would like to introduce my wonderful panelists. Uh, each of them in their own rights are quite accomplished in their field. And to actually go over their entire resume would be quite extensive. I was thinking about doing that, but it would actually probably take up most of the uh, discussion. So first, I'd like to introduce uh, Mary Wright. Mary Wright is an international league coach, uh, world coach. Uh, Hi, everyone. He's worked with uh, athletes from the USA, Canada, and New Zealand. Thank you for being Mary. We have also Olivia Estes, who's worked with yes. gymnasts uh, from the elite to the lowest levels uh, and the funnest level, <laughs> as we can say. She is from Beaches Gymnastics, where she's the owner and head coach. Uh, that's from Florida, Region 8, as you see. Next, we have Steve Arkell, who is a wonderful coach who's worked both with the Canadian and the American national programs. He is actually a member of the USAG national staff. I had the pleasure of working with him at the 100, 300 programs and, of course, national Park. And he's representing uh, Region 3 in Texas, good old San Antonio, one of my favorite places, Mavericks Gymnastics. And last but not least, we have Greg Zappa, who is uh, the owner and the head coach with his wife, Jen, in ENA Gymnastics up here in New Jersey. So he's a very good student. And he's in seven, and he has a wonderful world of information, too, from the elite to all the rules. So we're going to basically start with that. I just want to go over the format. Uh, once again, uh, please make sure you're muted or your video is off. So it does actually affect background noise and sound. This video is being recorded for other people to join, so we want to make sure that they have the best quality, free from, you know, lag and sound. So please, please make sure you turn off your audio. If you want to, okay, even the panelists, if you want to turn off your audio and you have some background noise, please do so. That would be great. Uh, for time purposes, we will only stay on topic, so we are not going to talk about the correct way to do it now, though or which way to blind and pirouette, all right? So stay on uh, if you need to do a chat, you want to ask a question, please write a chat specifically uh, to either Pat Goldsmith or John Lynn. We two are going to be doing the hosting. And then basically that's it. So once again, I want to welcome everyone. And quickly, uh, next week's episode, next week, episode three will be biomechanics and the body. Inertia, momentum, and force. Oh my! We have Dr. Gerald George, Dr. Dave, Terry Hoffman from Masters of Sports, and Tony Retrosi, the president of Seca and uh, the Momentum. So those four will be joining us next week. So we'll have a wonderful panel there. All right. So, panelists, if I may start off, the big question is: when you open, which in the phase one. What is your format going to be? Team first, class first, rep first, shorter hours, longer hours? Who would like to start us off? All right. Steve, why don't you start us off? Okay. Well, uh, we find out on the 27th uh, what phase we're going to be in. So hopefully we're in phase one. And we'll be starting with our teams. Uh, both compulsory and optional, and the plan right now is to uh, stagger them. 
So depending on how many athletes we're allowed to have in the gym at a time, that's, that's how we'll set it up. Um, uh, my buddies in region two have done some really cool stuff. Uh, and I know it's out on the internet, uh, kind of with some guidelines, you know, they're, they're trying to set it up for four kids per thousand square feet year facility. So 20,000 square foot gym, 80 kids. Uh, if you can spread it out properly, uh, you know, they're going to be taking the temperature of everyone that it comes in the gym uh, on their way in. And, and that's basically how we're going to start it. And then we're going to see uh, how the rec people feel, how comfortable they are, and, and before we start allowing them to, to come back. Yeah, how about Craig or Olivia? I actually am in Florida, so I think that I may be the first one of us possibly to open our um mayor is talking about opening me on may 1st which would be actually may 4th so we are opening for camp in the morning um we have the same system that steve is talking about about the four people per thousand square feet um we have the temperature store we have a machine like a fogging pipe machine that will do the station so the, it'll have time to sit as we go and for our team kids in the evening, we are going to begin at 50% of the hours. Yeah, and that's what you how, how long do you Omer, propose being at 50%? The, the panelists who aren't speaking mute themselves. So it doesn't echo. Yes, so panelists, if you don't mind, uh, we're hearing the feedback from other people talking. So if you can mute yourself when you're not talking and then just unmute yourself, that would be wonderful. All right, Mary, you have the floor. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, uh, I don't have a, a gym right now, but um, as far as moving from this COVID phase to the level one phase, I think we need to make sure that all of the athletes are physically in good shape, uh, doing conditioning exercises to allow every part of their body to be strong ready for the performances that they need when they return to the gym obviously none of the the uh, conditioning will be sport specific and that's a good thing uh, steve arkell and i talked about this earlier on today and that we both feel strongly that this is really a great opportunity for our girls to get some in every area and i've seen a lot of kids doing a lot of uh, uh, ab work and I worry a little bit that they're not stretching their hip flexors out afterwards because if we tighten up those hip flexors we're then going to set our kids up for possible back injuries so um, I think if we can keep the work doing uh, aerobic style runs whatever they need to do to get the entire body strong because the, they won't lose the muscle memory. The muscle memory is there for their skills. So when they do return to the gym, they are in the shape then to do sports specific conditioning and skill development. And again, that lead up will be dependent on all of the athletes and uh, the gyms and what they can do, how they can accommodate the kids in the gym. So that's my thought on that for right now. Hi, this is Craig. Um, um, my gym's in very northern New Jersey. Our gym is there, and we're about 15 minutes outside of uh, the George Washington Bridge. So we're in that epicenter of wherever you see everything going crazy. Um, so I have no idea when we're going to be reopening. Um, we're trying to make plans for when we reopen to do a blended type recreational as well as competitive program throughout the entire day. You know, like Steve said, we're going to have to have very limited people in the gym. And at first, my idea before is they might only start with two hours a day. I don't think it would be a reasonable expectation to have the gymnast in the gym for four hours because they're just not ready to handle that just yet when we first reopen. So we'll be doing a lot of basics, a lot of conditioning, a lot of as Mary said, you know, specific gymnastics conditioning to get them up to speed. And, you know, don't forget that, that, you know, these kids have been out of the gym between six, eight, 10, 12 weeks, depending on where you're at. And it's going to take eight weeks, 10 weeks to get back to where they were when we first stopped. So 
being able to progress the next season, you know, that's going to be a very big challenge on people. And I urge you to be very cautious and very slow in your comeback. So the injuries are at a reduced rate. You know, I'm going to be telling all my parents and all my athletes, as far as moving up to a next level, we're not even going to contemplate that for a long time. So uh, you got to put it in reality to them because we're in a uncharted territory in our sport. Thank you, Craig. Uh, so for other coaches, our panelists, our team panelists, what about the mental or the emotional factor? How do you feel that's going to be affected? And are you going to try to deal with that issue as well? Or is it going to be kind of like returning back from a vacation effort? If you can just unmute yourselves and answer, that'd be great. Do you want to start with, who do you want to start with, John? Uh, uh, let's go Steve. I saw him at his hand. So unmute yourself, Steve. Real quick, sorry I muted you. Yeah, just to get rid of the feedback. There we go. Better? You. Sorry, you. guys. Um, so I'll just tell you what we decided to do uh, going into it, uh, thinking about coming out, and we went in with a five or six week plan uh, because that's about what we thought this was going to be. Unfortunately, for some of us, it's going to be longer, um, and none of us have have coached through a, a pandemic. So. The, the idea that we had going in with the athletes, uh, because, you know, this is scary for kids, uh, was to just make sure uh, that they actually shift their focus away from gymnastics. We don't want to, you know, some of these kids are so caught up in gymnastics and, oh, this kid's going to get ahead of me and, and so on and so forth. And so we shifted away from gymnastics. We went to really fundamental exercises. Um, we still see all the kids every day because Gabby and I actually get up every morning and we do a Zoom conditioning with them. Uh, so everyone sees each other every day, but we shifted to basic human movement. And the message that we gave our athletes uh, was, you know what, right now guys, we're shifting our training and we're training for health, right? Uh, if you're healthy, your immune system is gonna be better. Right. So we're training for health right now. We're using basic human movement and coaches. I want you to think about this. All the gymnastics stuff that they've done, that's still in their neuromuscular system. It's not going anywhere. Okay. So if we work the fundamentals that all of these things spin off of. Um, so I mean, we went very basic. We need very little pounding, uh, very controlled when we do pounding. Um, and we do just basic movement. So we do push, pull, squat, hinge, rotation, and gait and run, because that's what everything else comes from. And this is an opportunity for us to, to not pound our athletes and to get them stronger in their fundamentals. Maybe take care of a, a weak area that an athlete might have, you know, if it's a lower back or something like that. So we've built for four weeks and we've just basically added repetition number. We're using light weight. So you know, we're doing some movement weighted, which is really, really good for these guys when they're developing, uh, you know, for connective tissue and things like that. So we plan on coming back stronger than we went into it and then transferring that into our gymnastics, which we've begun to do in, in week five. Uh, so after we condition together, then the kids have a a plan and it's a it's a five-week plan that you know has the main workout on, on monday a uh, little plyometrics uh, sprint builds which get harder and harder for four weeks and then they have little daily gymnastics stuff very simple fundamental press handstand held handstand things of that nature that are going to make us come out of this better because if they're stronger their alignment is better their basics are better i think the other stuff will come back really fast so that's kind of the approach we took to shift it away from gym to still see each other um, and to let the kids relax a little bit. You know, this could be a really good time actually. All right, Craig, do you want to take uh, your comments next? Same subject. Um, to build on what Steve's doing, you know, we're, we're doing very similar things. We're doing, you know, daily Zooms. Next week, we're actually gonna be splitting it up by level or groups of levels and doing a lot more individual Zooms with each group. Uh, now that we have the staff coming back uh, with the PPP programs and um, doing a lot of core strength and doing a lot of leg strength and building up stuff and 
maintaining their flexibility and maintaining uh, their healthy parts and rehabbing their injured parts. This was a, uh, a fantastic in, uh, rest period for a lot of the kids who were banged up uh, throughout the year and throughout their careers. And this was a forced rest, a rehab, get stronger, get healthy. We do a lot of uh, imaginary routines. You know, there's been a couple of studies that have been done where, you know, basketball players, where they just pretend to shoot the basket. So we do pretending bar routines. We do imaginary vaults. You go through the motion, you shut your eyes, you feel your body doing the vault. You feel your body doing the bar routine while you're switching your hands and you're pushing for the egg or throwing the bar for the Takacha. And, you know, to keep the muscle memory and have them watch themselves on videos doing the bar routine that they did all year. So they can replicate the feeling that they had in their brain while they're watching themselves do the bar routine to try to keep themselves in that mentality of this is what it felt like. So when we get back to doing it, it's not so foreign to them. Yes, the skills are going to be all over the map and they're probably not going to do as, as much as you even contemplate them doing, but their, their brains will uh, allow them to get back much faster if every day they can see themselves in their you know, mind's eye doing the routines constantly and doing their skills constantly and doing their basics constantly. So when we do get back, it might not be as you know, long as we thought it might be. Thank you, Craig. Mary, what about you? How do you perceive the, the mental or the emotional factor of bringing the athlete back? Okay. I th Oops, sorry, Mary, I muted you. I was trying to unmute you and you did it yourself. Can you unmute yourself again? All right. Oh, I did it again. Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Sorry about that. All good. Okay, no problem. Um, my feeling right now with this COVID phase, I think it's it's a really good time. And it sounds like a lot of our teachers, especially the panel, are doing everything right and, and uh, applying what each area of the body needs for their future progressions in gymnastics. And I think for the mindset of the kids, that if they feel that they're a part of the planning process, they are more into it. So um, I think if we can put to get, have the kids work on goal setting, and when that, you say goal setting, like, okay, so what do I do for goal setting? We'll divide it up into like the COVID phase, what you want to do in the COVID phase. And I think that maybe at this, that this would be building a mountain, putting together a mountain on a poster board. And I'll show you a poster board. Can you see that? So a poster board where the, the COVID phase, that they're, uh, they work on achieving all the at-home training that they can do. Then once they transition into the general prep phase and the skill development phase, which will probably be um, three, five, seven, ten weeks, whatever, whatever is required for the different levels. Obviously, the upper level kids may have a different comeback phase to the other kids. But allow the kids to actually write down goals of what they want to achieve in each of those phases, the routine development phase. Um, and they should have a, a final a resolution at the top of the mountain for what they, the big goal they want to achieve at the end of the season, whether it may be making it to the state meet, nationals or regionals, whatever that goal may be, put that at the top of the mountain and then have little switchbacks across the mountain with small goals. And so when they, when they put down any single goal that they want, they have to not just put down the goal, but be accountable for it by describing how they are going to, what they're going to do to achieve that goal. So when they feel that they have, it might be even skills that they want to, a skill that they have not even talked about with their coach, but they may think that, hey, I really would like to do a flick lay on beam. And I know it's not in my skill level right now, but I want to work towards that. So talk with the coach, see if it's, if it's manageable and if it's doable, fine, but make sure that they feel that they are a part of the process or every step of the way. And another way in which you can do with this with the kids is if these little small goals that they put down every day, not every day, but every week or whatever it might be, that they, they have a, a, a period at the end of that each phase of whether they reach that goal or not. 
So they just don't randomly pick something. It's a tangible thing that they fight towards and they set a time frame. Then the other thing I like doing with my kids, and it's worked really phenomenally, is I make them journal. And so every day they go into the gym, they, they line up and they say to the people around them, what am I going to do today that is going to make me better than I was yesterday? They write it down. And you think if a kid trains 300 days a week and they've made 300 areas where they are now better, it may be I'm going to be a better teammate. I'm going to get my legs straight on my kit. I'm going to make sure my toes are pointed in my dance. It may, whatever it might be for that day. But if, if, they, if they see these little goals and they check them off and then they can read back in their journal what they did, what they not, didn't quite make. Um, even if it's more so an effort to get there as opposed to actually achieving it. But I think it's, it's a great way for the kids to get 100% involved in their process. picture Mary was saying that this is one of our kids that just just did one right so all the all the kids are making is news they're interacting they're sharing them with each other and uh, I mean that sort of thing uh, Ali Arnold does a lot of that we do mental skills every week you know to keep them sharp the same thing that uh, you know Craig is talking about to, to connect with them and keep them keep them thinking that stuff very nice. Panel, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to control your mics to make it a little bit easier so we don't keep double tapping. So I'll turn you on and off. If you want to speak, just uh, raise your hand. And then that way, because I can see all the panelists. Yes. Okay. Hold on. Olivia, it's yours. Hold on. Why is I'm for no, There we go. I, yeah, I actually had it muted. So oh, okay. um, I agree with everything that everybody said. One of the first things that we d did in our gym was gave them sort of a chance to grieve their season. Um, I think it's hard mentally to move past that without being allowed to go through that process. So I did a lot of team Zooms and there were no conditioning on them. You know, there was no instruction, there was nothing. It was just like, how do you feel? Like, what can I do for you? Let's talk through this as a group. And so I think that because we did that early on in the process, we sort of as a unit have moved past the grief stage and while we were grieving the season, there was also this, the two weeks to rest, really. So, and that's important. Everybody's body needs that. Um, there's arguments that you need more than two weeks, but and we gave them two. And then we sort of moved to like a comp, like what Steve was saying, it's very basic movement. It's running, it's your form and your running. It's um, stuff that you can do in your garage, but it's very, very simple. We're not doing any real gymnastic specific conditioning with our team. Um, I did set up some complexes, like it's like a leg complex you can do in your yard. Most of it is actually stuff that you could do with your family. So they're having a lot of fun actually doing it with their family, posting the pictures, funny videos of their parents trying. Um, I actually think that that, because we involved the whole family has sort of raised their confidence a little bit. Like they realize how much stronger they are, they are than the average person. And, um, and we're pretty excited to get back. I mean, obviously it's gonna be slow, but I, we focus a lot on, <clears throat> excuse me, on the character development. You know, it's hard to teach um, blind changes and stuff in, in a garage, but we did a project this week where it's a vision board like Steve's. It's on generosity, like how to be generous with your time to your teammates during the coronavirus, um, how to highlight their talents. So I feel like we are mentally a very, very strong team right now, probably more than we ever have been. And the physical building of it is something that I think is probably going to be easier on the back end than the mental part. Hey, thank you very much, Olivia. Uh, yes, Steve, it is now yours. So I, I like that stuff a lot. We've been doing similar things. Um, you know, we had, a, we had a parent do a handstand against the wall for over two and a half minutes to win their daughter a leotard. And so that was, I mean, that was really cool. And, and she only did it, she only won by 0.2 seconds. So, 
Um, you know, there's lots of stuff that you can do at home and there's, there's lots of learning opportunity in, in what we're going through. And as far as the basic conditioning and, and movement stuff, there's nothing easy about that. You know, muscle contraction and recruiting muscle fiber uh, can be done in any exercise. So the kids can come out of this much, much stronger if they're, if they're working hard, working on the form. I love the stuff that Craig said. Uh, you know, thumbs up on, on the mental imagery and going through those things. All of these are things that we can still interact with our athletes at, on a daily basis. You know, I mean, I really miss my athletes, but I'm really having fun uh, having to communicate with them in different ways as well. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have a couple of quick questions. Uh, these are questions where I just like to get a quick answer from each of you individually. I'll unmute you uh, in order. Uh, Basically, the first question is, um, how many hours per week are your team kids doing Zoom? Uh, are they broken up by levels? All right, uh, let's hit uh, Craig first. I'm gonna, uh, okay. Looks like you'll have to do it yourself. You must be locked. Right? Yeah, okay. Um, our plan this upcoming week is to do between four, four to four and a half hours of Zoom uh, work with each group that we're doing and we're going to combine groups we're going to combine nine and ten we're going to combine um probably six seven eight together maybe six seven and eight separately um so and then compulsory separate of that we plan to do an excel win there as well so we plan to do four to five hours a week about an hour hour and a half per day uh led by all the different coaches um one of the things that we might do is i'll do bars the whole week say with everybody and then another staff member will do beam another staff member will do vault and we'll try to keep it consistent throughout the week with each group obviously we'll do harder with the more advanced levels easier with the lower levels and then next week we'll we'll switch it up to where i'll do floor or vault uh, we've done every event um throughout the week right now um you know we're doing about four days of zooming currently and i want to up it next week so that's what we're trying to accomplish okay olivia hey so we are doing five days of facebook uh, um live delivery to a private group with them and then we are doing two days with zoom with all team zooms and then the three days of the week that the all team zoom does not meet i'm meeting with the optional specifically and I, I think that sort of is working we were not doing the team, the optional group separately before, and that that was a mistake. So we've switched that up. And so now they have their own Zoom as well, but they're showing up to the all team Zoom to, you know, cheer on their, you know, their little teammates. Okay, um, Steve, I can get your input on that. Sure. We. Uh directly do Zoom conditioning with the kids uh, five to five and a half hours a week. It's, it's roughly an hour uh, every, every morning. And then they have a, a separate assignment on the side. And I would venture to guess uh, they warm up before we do Zoom and things like that. They've got jump rope and things of that nature that most probably on top of that uh, five, five and a half, they probably spend another hour to an hour and a half a day on, on their separate things at home that we give them. Okay, thank you. Mary, what would your uh, thoughts be on the online training and how it's progressing? I, I think I, what's amazed me is how all the gyms have taken it upon themselves, the coaches to, to do this. I think it's remarkable what our, our gymnastics community is doing. Um, Masters of Sport have put um, information out on their Facebook page, but as far as the individual kids, I know that Naomi Hoffman, she goes into her gym every day. She does a yoga Zoom lesson with everyone, as well as their strength conditioning, so that they're always extended, stretched out afterwards, which I think is phenomenal. But for me personally, I, my Zoom session starts with me getting out of bed, going to the latte machine, making my latte, then going outside in the sun and drinking it, and it takes me about an hour. 
That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, since I have you, Mary, uh, stay there. Um, <laughs> another question. We, that was by, uh, by the way, a question from Melanie. Now I'm going to go to Andrea. Andrea asks, uh, in general, what do you feel should be the reduction of hours from training? Like if an athlete was training 30 hours a week, what should they go to? If they're training 10 hours. I assume with classes, because they're only coming in a few hours a week, that shouldn't be affected. But how would you deal with like the elite athlete, the higher optional yeah. level athletes, especially ones that were trying to go for college for the next year? I think with the elite athletes, they could come in and do at least two hours a day, maybe a, a hard day and then a light day, a hard day and a light day and so on. They, um, they need to do just some basic skills, swinging on the bars, kip cast handstands, I mean, just some handstands, some uh, basic back handsprings, whatever it might be but not in a quick fashion like we usually train very efficiently. Let them take the time and get into it so they get a really strong warm-up, a good complex on beam before they start, and a good warm-up, and then some basic skills. A vault, just maybe some handstand step-down layouts off the vault, table falls, um, some running drills, just whatever it takes, but just do it on a, a smooth basis, not a, you know, normally we're on a crunch time and we're very efficient and we get the numbers right away make it a way more relaxed setting and then slowly build the hours and increase the uh, the efficiency of training for the elites and, and level 10s especially and then obviously class kids they come and want an hour a week that's fine they can handle it um, compulsory level kids if they usually come three days a week come three days a week maybe do an hour and a half to start off with just see how they feel make it more warm up on each event, complexes, basics, handstands, uh, conditioning skills that are specific to gymnastics, and obviously a lot of stretching. So that, that's how I would apply it. Um, yeah, I'm going to be a very big proponent of cutting their hours in the beginning um, because I'm worried about an injury factor when we get back because you're going to have to pull the reins back on these thoroughbreds and they're going to want to go, go, go. And you as a coach have to be smart and understand that they're just not ready to go yet. You know, there are going to be athletes who could possibly be ready because you have those athletes that no matter how much time they take off, they walk back in the gym and they're just like, okay, here I am. Let's go. Let's do that double back today. And you're going to have to, you know, keep them back um, because they're just not ready to do it uh, physically and it also might be an emotional state as well. You know, they get back to the gym and they're so happy to see their friends, they're distracted. Uh, they've just been through a tremendous uh, crazy ordeal and they're still dealing with an ordeal um, in their personal lives. So you as the coach, you're gonna have to be very smart and keep them grounded and understand that you are the coach and it's your job to protect them from themselves as they move forward in their uh, gymnastics. So. You know, if a 20 hour kid, you know, I'm looking at doing a 10 hour for at least two weeks and then you bring, can bring them up another few hours. But, you know, my proponent is stay calm and you have plenty of time till their first meets, especially optional kids in January. If you can get back into the gym in June or even get back to the gym in July, you still have six months. That's a lot of time. So don't be panicked. Don't push for those kids to be ready to go come September or October like you might normally have done. It's okay that if they're just starting to get ready in December next year. Everybody's in the same boat in this one in terms of development. So you're going to see maybe teams rolling out their first meets a month later than we normally did. You know, I usually did my first optional meet in December, and we always call it in our gym, we call it the Crash and Burn Invitational because you just don't know what's going to happen. And maybe that concept's not going to happen until January. You know, you got to get out there at some point, but maybe it's going to happen a month or two months later. Um, JO Nationals and Easterns and Regionals for eight and state meets are not until April and May. So uh, don't panic. Steve, can you address the same question? Uh yeah, I uh, agree uh, with, with Craig. I like a lot of the things he said, the message to give to the kids. Hey, you're all in the, you're all in the same boat. Some are going to come back faster than others. Um, with our compulsory kids, we'll probably cut hours and go with less hours. 
Uh, with our optional kids, it'll be volume based because I feel like we can control volume more. And we'll start with the low volume of, of fundamentals, basics, you know, uh, things into the pit, the tumble track, using our soft surfaces as much as possible. And then we'll just start begin to build volume individually based on how the kids feel. And then that's the approach that we'll take. Okay, thank you so much. We're gonna move on now to uh, some other questions. And uh, someone did mention a good point. Uh, keep in mind that we do have athletes like collegiate athletes who, who actually take off time once their season's done. And it, we actually have a great panel of a collegiate coaches that will be coming up uh, down the road and they can discuss more about that preparation. And someone also mentioned that in New Zealand, Mary Wright was very familiar with where their elite athletes would also take off too. You know, it's a lot, a lot of that times it's about training smarter, about, you know, not burning out the body, having that longevity in the sport, like we have Oksana Chusevitnia and many other athletes. So uh, once again, uh, Craig, Stephen, the panel have been right in saying, don't panic. Take your time, prep your athletes. A good, strong foundation will probably be better in the long run. So we definitely want to keep that in mind. I'm going to go next to uh, Livia. Uh, one of the questions we have asked is, uh, what preparations for the gym are you going to do? And the factor of cleaning equipment, spacing equipment, maybe readjusting things, putting a spotting belt in, <laughs> you know, maybe limiting pit activity. Anything you can think about in the actual preparation of the gym phase for your gymnast, it's all yours. Um, so for the pit specifically, we are gonna only allow our top 12 athletes to have access into the pit, which sort of eliminates the, you know, they need access, I think at this point, not to take hard landings. So if only 12 athletes out of the whole gym ever enter, I think that sort of mitigates some of the risk. Um, I have sort of outlined, we have four team events, you know, we have beam one, beam two, bar one, bar two, bar three, pit bar. So we have 12 places that people can be. Um, I'm only gonna use six of them at a time. And then we will rotate to the other six. It'll leave the 20 minutes open in order to clean the six they just came from. As far as, I think it was Craig earlier said temperature checks. We're gonna do it on our staff. We're gonna do it going through um, for the kids that come through. I'm going to have a morning and a night crew for staff, which means that if you come in the morning, you're only exposed. The kids that are coming in the morning will never come in the afternoon. So they're not, these are not gonna cross over. So your athletes, that are morning, only see morning coaches. The morning coaches never move into the evening kids, which should limit the exposure. It's kind of the, what the military system is doing right now. And the same thing for your afternoon. We have about three groups of coaches if we run at this phase, which means that if somebody is to get sick, we will be able to pull the entire group of coaches, the staff out and do the quarantine. That to me is probably the worst case scenario. Um, we have, I have lots of painter's tape. It's going all around the gym. We have boxes. So like you're the yellow box today. So you stand in the yellow box until you move to your station. The yellow box will be on beam. It'll be on bars. It'll be on the floor. Um, I think the stations need to be about six feet apart. And that's sort of where we are in this process. But I think that having 20 minutes to clean empty, empty events is we'll make the schedule roll a little, a little bit faster. You know, I, I agree with Olivia. We're going to have to spread out everybody as, as much as we can and limit the exposure of cross-contamination between different groups. And I really like her idea of the same kids coming in the morning and same different group of kids coming in the evening. So they never really interact with each other. Maybe that will help parents think, okay, we only see this group of 10 kids at all times. That's what my athlete is exposed to. Um, you know, it's very difficult to uh, ease the parental fears that they want to come back into the sport and come back in your facility. So you're going to have to be seen wiping stuff down with Lysol wipes. I have a fogging machine with a disinfectant that I spray the entire gym down. I've been doing that for years anyway, um, because I'm kind of crazy and I don't want athlete's foot or any bacteria and stuff. So every single day I've already, I've been disinfecting the gym for years. So I would just do that 
you know, twice a day. It takes about 10 minutes for me to do the whole gym. And then you have to let it sit for 15, 10 minutes before it comes inert. Um, when this first started, I was doing it three times a day, uh, morning, noon, and night, and back, you know, cycle every day. It's going to be a very big challenge. Uh, I'm not sure the correct advice to give everybody. I think everybody has to figure out how they're going to properly coach inside their own gym, as well as make sure the kids are safe, washing their hands, staying away from each other. Uh, I'm going to go to individual Tupperware chalk boxes for the kids. So everybody has their own individual Tupperware chalk box. Uh, so we're not sticking the same hands in the chalk um, as we used to always do. Maybe different water bottles. Uh, bars is going to be a nightmare because one kid gets on, the other kid gets off, you know. So that's going to be a thing. And beam, we might have to just designate beams. Uh, so, you know, like our gym, we only have four high beams. So maybe we can only do four kids on beam. I'm fortunate that I don't have a free foam fit. So I don't have to worry about the problem most of you have. So, um, you know, Olivia, I don't have to deal with your problem of free foam pit and limited 12. We don't have one. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a challenge and I commend everybody for trying to figure it out from themselves. It's going to be difficult. Greg, we had a lot of questions about your log machine and where they can get it and what you're using them at. Let me, un okay. Um, I had bought the, um, fogging machine. I'll put in the chat where I got it from. I know they're out of stock, uh, right now. It, is a company called Nixalite, and it's called a cold fogging machine. And the um, the product that I used in it is a chemical. It's called QD64, and it is a bacterial and viral disinfectant. And it is listed as on the EPA website as something that kills Corona type viruses, SARS, MERS, and all staff and uh, different um, sicknesses and illnesses and bacteria and viruses. So it's something that we would do all the time anyway. So it's a good practice because I try to keep everything as clean as possible. It's the worst thing in the world when a parent calls you up and said, I know my kid got ringworm from your place. And you can't prove it, but how are you gonna disprove it? So uh, as clean as you can keep your gym at all times, even after this is over, that's my recommendation. Steve, do you mind addressing the same question? Uh, no, we will be doing really most of the things that these guys have hit as well. One thing we'll, we'll ask the parents is we want to limit viewership. We want as few people in the gym as possible. Uh, I, did, I didn't hear that. Um, I mean, essentially, you know, we're going to do the, the fever checks. We're going to stagger our rotations so that there is time for the instructors to disinfect even between classes and events. So that, as Craig said, people are out there doing that. The gym will be broken into quadrants. That we're working on that right now. And, you know, between, uh, you know, rotations, the kids will stand up and they'll actually move together from quadrant to quadrant. So they'll stay apart the whole time. So we're going to have to slow things down uh, and just pay attention, have as few people in the gym as possible. Um, and, the, you know, the fogger that uh, Craig was talking about, Hitachi makes one of those as well. There are a couple companies that make them that are even wireless and, and maybe, or not wireless, batten, just batten, no cord. Um, and then there are some companies that make, it's like a fogger in a can, like, you know, if you've ever set up a bomb in your house one night and you can set them around the gym, you can set those bombs off at night and they'll do the same thing. Hey, Steve, since I have you also, would you address the issue of uh, will you make your staff wear masks or will you make them mandatory coronavirus tests for themselves? Um, we'll have them wear masks and we're going to try and get uh, everyone tested. Uh, San Antonio just opened up a couple drive through testings that are free. So we're going to try and utilize those and get those through, you know, just to make sure. Um, you know, I think that all those things are really, really important right now that uh, you know, we just are as sanitary as we can possibly be. That's wonderful. Does anyone else want to chime in on that real quick? On the testing of athletes, otherwise, oh, okay, Craig, yes. Uh, let me try to unmute my, um, so I saw a, um, 
a post in our local or might have been national Facebook, I'm not sure, but somebody was making masks for, for uh, people who are deaf and hard of healing, where it was a cloth mask, but the middle part was plastic. And so the person can see your mouth uh, talk. And I'm going to try to look into that for coaches use. Because that way, the, the, when the athlete looks at you, they can see your uh, expressions and they can see your, uh, you know, yourself talking. And it might not be as scary for them to be in the gym with the coach, com you know, not completely covered up. So I'm going to definitely look, at, look into that because uh, it's going to be very odd. Um, and any parent who is in the waiting room, they're going to have to wear a mask. And I'm going to limit uh, people in the waiting room. It's obviously I, we, you I think we have to allow parents in, but it can be one parent per group. So maybe four parents in the lobby or five parents in the lobby, and that's it. Once the five parents are there, everybody else has to stay outside. Sorry, but we have to do our part, just like you can't all you know, congregate in a store. They make you wait outside. We're gonna have to wait outside of the gym school too. And we're not saying that we're banning parents from the gym. We really can't do that. But we can voluntarily ask our parents to kind of limit their attendance, how much time they spend in the kid, gym. I know for a lot of optional and elite parents who spend, you know, hours there, sometimes they just drop their kids off and do other things and then come back at the end. I know a lot of gyms are also talking about, you know, putting in camera systems or remote view systems. So uh, just like Zoom, you can have it set up and they can watch it from their screen on their phone while they're shopping. So there are a lot of options. We're not saying that we're banning parents literally, but we want to reduce that cross-contamination. I'd like to go back to Mary real quickly. Uh, Mary, since our sport is, uh, is a physical kind of hands-on sport, you know, when we're spotting and we're kind of high-fiving or hugging our athletes and, and safe sports kind of moved us away a little bit, but this is definitely gonna move us away again. How do you feel that's going to take its toll on coaching, losing that kind of direct physical interaction, whether it's spotting or just motivational? Mary? I think that's going to be hard because um, I, for me, I like to touch. I like to have my kids. Um, I like to pet them on the back. And um, it's, it's going to be hard for a lot. And as long as the kids and the coaches reinforce each day that hey listen you know we can't touch today we can't hug we can't high five but hey we're all there in this together and make it light and, and light-hearted and and fun but um that is tough and the other thing is what worries me is how long are we going to be training like this because if we are training like this for months and months we have to reassess our goals and we have to reassess our competition program everything because if we've got four kids in one quadrant and four in another training and, and the coaches are going to be spending 15 hours a day in the gym to cover all their teams. And how long can we do that? that that's a tough one. Olivia, same question. Oh, with the spotting question. And, and the contact, the physical contact. Um, I think that we're going to need to be really creative with ways to express that the kids are doing well, like the positive impact on, and have a positive impact on them. As far as the spotting, um, I'm in the camp of, I don't spot on beam at all under basically any circumstance, um, except for like handstands and level three dismounts. So I don't think we have a real issue on beam. Um, the kids that I do think needs actual spotting are the 12 kids that I think that I'm going to let have loose foam access. Um, I think that we're going to be in this situation for, for months, but I think that the building phase for, you know, I'm not going to move basically out of phases until the physical abilities testing tells me to, you know, I'm not deadlining it at two weeks or four weeks. So I'm going to wait till the, the numbers tell me to move. I think that there won't be a need for a bunch of hands-on spotting probably for eight weeks or so. And then I think we're going to evaluate. Steve, what about bars though? That, that's definitely a spotting event. Mind addressing that? No, 
Not at all. I, I think it's a good challenge for everybody, uh, including the athletes. And you could put it to your athletes as a challenge. Hey, you know what? We can't do a lot of touchy, feely, you know, catching and things like that. So uh, we as coaches need to do a fundamentally better job breaking the skills down into parts and then looking at them and seeing when the kids are, are ready to go. But really all the major skills that they do, you know, you can slide quarter pits in and things like that and have kids help each other. You know, Takachev's major releases, that's how a lot of uh, kids learn them anyway. So I don't really see that as being much of an issue. I mean, you can timer and you can get things right and spend some time on it, you know, without having to grab the kids and spot them and things like that. You, you, what you may find, coaches, is you may end up uh, being a better coach, you know, having to break it down more, having to, to see more, having to get the action you want from the bar before you let them, you know, you just start throwing them through things. So just break it down more. You should port a pits and things of that nature. Uh, set drills up that are, are nice and safe, you know, shoot over to port a pits with the feet up and things of that nature and, and uh, get right back to it. All right, Craig, thank you. Uh, um, you know, in reference to spotting, I wholeheartedly agree with Olivia. We never spot anything on beam. Um, and we're going to have to get very creative in drills and figure out ways for them to accomplish skills on their own. And in the time being, they're just not going to work upgrades that they need a spot on. That's just reality right now. And they're going to be going back to basics and doing skills they can do on their own. And normally we get up there and we spot every single kid on five cast handstands a couple of times. You're just not going to do that. So you're going to use a lot of bounce bar and uh, casting as high as you can on their own. And, um, give them corrections from standing, you know, back away from the bar. And uh, the athletes are going to have to take a lot more responsibility for their own corrections. And they're going to have to take much more responsibility to do what the coach is asking to do. Mary, uh, I'm going to go uh, back. I, to I, yeah, I, I, Are you ready for me? Yes, yes, please talk. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, I, I think the key for this phase of training is, as Steve said, to break. Like, I, I'm a huge proponent of breaking down each skill. I, I always say there are a minimum of three parts or four parts to a skill. And let's learn each part individually. Get each part looking great. And then you put the skill together. And I think we're going to go back doing that more, which I think is wonderful anyway. And have the kids, like for example, tone on bars, learn the late drop on the floor, learn the swing under, under the, on a, a separate section, learn the up part of the, the skill on another, on another section, uh, back and spring on being, learn the back handspring, learn the arm throw, learn the jump, learn the handstand split, learn the step down, learn all the individual parts to a skill, then put them together. And I think that will allow us not to have to spot a lot at all. And the kids will have to rely on the feeling and their, their muscle memory to feel the skill, feel the correction. And I, I think in its own way, it's going to help all of us. And um, as Craig said, we're all going to be better coaches for it. Thank you very much, Mary. I actually do agree. I think in some ways, this is kind of a mixed blessing. It will make our athletes better. I mean, think of also the confidence level. You know, when an athlete does a skill by themselves on the beam and they haven't been trained or need that constant spotting, it does build a certain character. And that becomes a philosophy. You know, that becomes a system within your gym. Uh, gyms that do a lot of heavy spotting. I, I've seen gyms where, you know, the coaches are spotting everything. I've been to uh, regionals and national meets where they're still spotting their release moves, you know, and actually on blocks. And you're going, well, what's going on? So in some ways, this is going to force our athletes to be more independent. This is going to force our coaches to not let just kids slide in who can barely make the skill one out of 10 times and really demand excellence, uh, demand a, a certain amount of responsibility, and I think it's going to build stronger character. So I do agree, Mary. I, I really think with all of you panelists, I think this is actually, in a, in a way, a mixed blessing. And because of the way safe sport is moving, you know, uh, and it's and I won't lie, you know, it's actually good for our bodies too. I mean, uh, 
as many of you coaches know, those rotators and those shoulders and those elbows, they really start to feel it after a couple thousand spots. Uh, Olivia, I'd like to uh, go to you next. Okay, I'll unmute you. Uh, maybe you can unmute yourself. For some reason, it's not giving me access. About uh, building upwards in our skills. Oh, Olivia seems like it's a little bit frozen. So I'm going to move uh, to, yeah, she, she'll be joining us. Sorry about that little technical difficulty. So I'm going to move back to Craig. Uh, uh, one of the questions that was asked is about building up the little guys. As we know, the little guys, lots of hands-on spotting, lots of hands-on shaping, helping them with the glide kip, helping with them tap swings and stuff. How are you going to see your developmental or your preteen program differently within this coronavirus program? Um, I, I think all the, you know, let's take, for example, on bars, all the shaping that you would do by hand while they're holding a bar, you're going to have to do it on the floor. You're going to have to get very creative and set up places where they can put their foot up on a block and hold the floor bar and do all the proper shaping on the floor. And you're going to have to be extremely creative to mimic what you want on the bar, on the floor, and really go back to you know, developing a lot of really good drills. So when they get up onto the bar, they can, they know what they're supposed to feel like. And you can say, well, you know, your stomach was a little low on here. Remember when you were on the floor, you had your stomach up in that cast. So let's get back to that shape. So I think you're going to have to spend a lot more time off the equipment than on the equipment for body shaping with your little kids. Okay, thank you very much, Craig. I'd like to address that same question to Steve about the developmental phases of our pre-team and our uh, developmental athletes, how to shape them for them and work with them without spotting in close contact. Um, you know, I think we're going to have to do a, a much better job with physical preparation with shaping on the, on the floor, uh, like what Craig said, you know, feet on a block or feet on a wall where you're just, you know, you're, you're going lower, 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 getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, and I, I also think that it's going to require more time and, and we're going to have to work uh, with our athletes more on self-discipline. It's, it's not, not our discipline. It's, it's them being disciplined enough to get the position, to get it right, to, to work on it, um, which is, again, I think going to make all of our gyms stronger anyway. But there are, are methods and drills to break all of these skills down uh, in, into 10 parts instead of three. I love what Mary said about the three. I think that's right. I think three is a minimum. Um, and I think that we can build it more and, and break it down more and, you know, spend more time on our drills and our endurance during this time until we get through this. Hey, John, I got picked out. I'm not really sure what the question is. Can you address the uh, subject about building skills and building our athletes? And then we're going to add some final notes and then we're almost done, everyone. Oh, okay. Um, I think I don't, didn't hear what anybody else said, but I sort of built, I know some people have it in their eye class system, but I've built sort of a program for every skill that we have. So like the hurdle has prereqs and it has um, physical abilities that you need and it has benchmarks that you need to hit. And so we're going to sort of begin at the beginning of the programs and build from there. And I believe that if we do that, then the basics will be stronger and every skill will be better. As far as like building the new skills, I think that one of the things that we do in the US is, because we're all fairly lucky to have access to a loose foam pit, is we build skills down into the pit. And I think that right now with the danger associated with just being in it, I think that we should look at building skills up, like I build both skills up. I build double backs up to resis before I ever put a double back on the ground. And I used to do that when I didn't have a pit. And I think that's a really important thing to look at right now because it's safe, we can clean it, it makes you a better coach, and it also requires just less hands-on activity. 
Very good, very good. Uh, if you have any final notes, we're gonna start closing everything up, Olivia. Any final comments or notes you wanna make? No, nope. thank you so much for having me, John. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, Mary, I'd like to go to you next. Uh, if you can give me any final advice or comments or words of wisdom. Um, I, I think that if, if the kids and the coaches work together and be uh, success driven do, by doing, by believing in themselves, by uh, achieving skills, by making, falling and getting up and trying again, by building confidence, uh, basically working together. I think we've got, this is a great time that athletes and coaches can work together more intimately and um, apply like uh, shapes, shapes can be done. That, that is like in, in gymnastics, when we never see the rounded body position in any other sport. And if we take the time to learn those body shapes individually, separately, and because if the kid knows the shape, they can get into the shape. If they can't feel the shape, they won't be able to hold the shape or transfer movement patterns through the shape. So I think we could spend a lot of time on shapes, which we're going to have to do. And um, I just think that it just let the kids and the coaches, this is unknown territory. We, we just have to take our time. We have to be smart and be successful by challenging the kids, challenging the coaches, and building great, great confidence. Okay, thank you so much, Mary. That was really wonderful. We're gonna go to Craig next for some final words of wisdom. So as everybody starts to prepare for their openings, you know, one of the things that um, I, I think you should look to is, this is a rebirth or a reopening, uh, a starting a brand new of your program. Anything that you didn't like of your program shouldn't ever come back. There's a lot of times where you get stuck in a rut and you can't change something because you've been doing it for so long and it's just part of what you do every day. It doesn't have to be like that anymore. If something didn't work and you know it didn't work, do not bring it back. Don't be afraid to completely change to get better. Um, so things inside your business, things inside your coaching, things inside yourself or things with your athletes, you know, don't bring the bad stuff back, you know, get everybody to buy into the new vision of what's going to be. And especially when you get back to uh, full speed, you carry the, all the good stuff that you've been doing and leave all the bad baggage behind. So, you know, consider this as a fresh start of your program. And if you do that, you can get rid of all the bad baggage that you carried on. Hey, thank you, Craig. And finally, uh, Steve, if you may mention some of your words of wisdom and your prep. Um, good stuff, guys. Like, I like uh, all these ideas. Um, the one thing that uh, I would take the opportunity, because this is a, an opportunity uh, like what Craig said, and take the opportunity to challenge your kids to get stronger to get physically fitter. Um, an idea, one of the things that we're doing is we're gonna put up a new records board in the gym for compulsories and optionals and then overall. And, and give the kids something to focus on for a while. Hey, let's see how many more press handstands I can do, how you know, long I can hold my handstand. And just take the opportunity to change the focus uh, back to, to basics and getting really strong. Uh, and you know, the personal challenge it's gonna be for everybody to do things with less spotting and breaking things down. It's a great challenge for your athletes uh, as well. And so, you know, there's an opportunity in, in everything, I believe. So uh, I wanna thank all you guys. I want everyone to stay safe. Um, John, I really like this. It, it kind of reminds me of uh, comedians and cars having coffee, only it's gymnastics and coaches. So I, I vote that next time we have coffee as well. And thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. I agree. We have to have definitely more comedy and call. Thank, so yeah. Thank you, John. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate inviting me on. It's great to see everybody. Thank My you so much. So once again, I, I wish to thank all the panelists. I wish to thank Olivia, uh, Mary, Craig, and Steve. I mean, if they want to just say their goodbyes, we want to thank them all from the bottom of our heart. Uh, very informative. Thank you so much. We will be posting this online. Uh, for you to view on YouTube. If there's any uh, slides or anything you want to send my way, I can add that to the main video. 
Once again, thank you so much for attending, and I'll look forward to seeing everyone next week for episode three. So thank you for coming to Coaches on Couches. Have a great weekend, everyone. Be well and be safe. Bye-bye. Thank you, John. Thanks, thank Mary. you, John. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Stay safe. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. I'm looking forward to watching the gym for phase one opening soon. You guys will be our role models. <laughs> See you, John. Thanks, Craig. Thanks for everything. Thanks, Steve. Uh, it's going to be a long day. I hope we open soon. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Good luck, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, everyone. It was really fun. My pleasure, Mary. Thank you again. Thanks, Mary. Thanks. Thanks, Olivia. We'll FaceTime tomorrow. Don't get rid of that. The options. Hi, John. Yes. Chris Troyer. Sorry. What time did the meeting start? Was uh, it? It's always 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Eight to nine. So uh, it'll be, uh, we'll have next week, next Friday, I'll show you, we will have Dr. Gerald uh, George. You said eight, eight o'clock Eastern time? Yes. 